I have a few comments. Throughout our history, small businesses, especially those owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, have faced real challenges when it comes to participating on equal footing in the American economy and specifically in the federal procurement space. The federal government has also established a statutory goal of 5% of all eligible contracting and subcontracting dollars to small and disadvantaged business concerns, including those that are not currently participants in the 8A program uh, where there is still more needed support. That's why I applaud President Biden's goal of increasing the share of contract awards to small and disadvantages from 15% or, excuse me, from 5% to 15 percent by the year 2025. Uh, for over 40 years, socially and economically uh, disadvantaged businesses have relied on the 8A program to help them compete and innovate in the federal marketplace. And Ms. Uh, Robinson Burnett, I'd like to just turn to you quickly before yielding. Uh, as was previously mentioned, the President has a goal of increasing the share of federal contracts and dollars to small and disadvantaged firms from 5 to 15 percent by 2025. In your experience, are there any specific steps that the SBA should be taking and that we should be holding them accountable for to ensure that the initiative results in agencies reserving more opportunities for the 8A program and not less? Thank you, Chairman, for that question. When I was a contracting officer years ago, in accordance with the federal acquisition regulation and my contract training, my first step was to conduct market research for any acquisition that came across my desk to determine if the rule of two could be met. Can two or more small businesses do the work? And if so, I would set the work aside for small businesses, or I would find an indefinite delivery contract or a GWAC, one of these multiple award contracts that would allow set aside for small businesses. With the a shrinking acquisition workforce and the new increase in use of GWACs and category management, contracting officers are picking a contract vehicle first, bypassing the small business staff and saying that contract doesn't require them to set aside for small business. Even if an incumbent is the small business that would be devastated with the loss of this work or the program was in the 8A program, they pull it out and put it into these contracts. I think the SBA must get um, more depth and more depth engage with the Ozdaboos and the small business directors at these agencies to learn what is really happening at their level in terms of how, do, how the challenges they have with getting contracting officials to abide by the rule of two. Um, the OFPP memo, the White House memo M2203, Advancing Equity in Procurement, now requires uh, OFPP and SBA and the Ostaboos to work together on category management. I think it's important that they look across the government and engage in every level. It, are contracting officials abiding by the rule of two? When small businesses can do the work, is the work going to small business? Thank you. No. Um, some federal agencies had started decreasing their contracts going to the 8A program because the pool was shrinking and they didn't want their uh, contracts tied into the 8A program and not have enough firms to perform the work. I would make sure that the SBA shift uh, their focus to include every firm that is eligible. Um, the SBA can provide statistics on their applications, but when I was at the SBA, I thought the issue with the declining pool was we weren't receiving enough applications. Then I found we were receiving 2,300 applications a year and certifying 300. You said something about shifting the SBA's culture. Yes. What do you mean by that? Right now, the focus is making sure they mitigate the risk of firms getting into the program that shouldn't be in the program, focusing on the fraud. And really, that's the one or 2% of firms that apply. And so the other 90 plus percent of firms are struggling to get in like this the Lieutenant Colonel that I talked about because the SBA is focused on the wrong thing. Um, some federal agencies had started decreasing their contracts going to the 8A program because the pool was shrinking and they didn't want their uh, contracts tied into the 8A program and not have enough firms to perform the work. 
I would make sure that the SBA shift uh, their focus to include every firm that is eligible. Um, the SBA can provide statistics on their applications, but when I was at the SBA, I thought the issue with the declining pool was we weren't receiving enough applications. Then I found we were receiving 2,300 applications a year and certifying 300. You said something about shifting the SBA's culture. Yes. What do you mean by that? Right now, the focus is making sure they mitigate the risk of firms getting into the program that shouldn't be in the program, focusing on the fraud. And really, that's the one or 2% of firms that apply. And so the other 90 plus percent of firms are struggling to get in, like this lieutenant colonel that I talked about, because the SBA is focused on the wrong thing. Okay, and is payment, is, are there any reasons that, pe that businesses don't apply because the payment's not there, the uh, requirements are, are too costly? And I know I'm over my time, Chairman, but a, a quick answer to that is that do, do some small businesses not apply because it's simply not worth it? Please, Ms. Robinson Brennan. Um, as I said, over 2,300 firms apply every year. They're, they're applying. Um, only th 300 are being brought in. Firms are paying advisors four to $10,000 to do applications for them. Um, so they're interested. Right. They, it's just very difficult to get through the cumbersome process at the SBA, not relative to el eligibility, but mistakes or in the application that has nothing to do with are they eligible. One of the things we really, I think, are committed to doing in this committee is to find a way to start being able to mark some progress so that five years from now, this is still not the, the discussion. Um, and I want to take a moment just to thank again all of our witnesses, Mr. Harrison, Ms. Lee, Mr. Corona, and Ms. Ms. Robinson Burnett. Um, I have to say I'm a little troubled to hear, though, that I, and I was not aware of this, and maybe it's my own fault, that if you are an 8A contractor and you die or you retire after 20, 25 years or something else happens and your business is sold to me, that all of the contracts that are in place are considered null and void. I mean, that really, really disturbs me. Particularly, I think, as you said, Ms. Robinson Burnett, that that's not the case with any other category of business. So um, there are a lot of good ideas and suggestions from all of you that I hope we will find our way to make uh, into legislation. Um, the ranking member and I, as I've said before, are committed to real change. Uh, and change that's verifiable so that we're able to mark uh, progress. But again, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Ms. Salazar. Uh, she was kidding earlier. <laughs> she wasn't really kidding. This is the first time we've sat together on a committee because we've been uh, in a hybrid virtual situation. But here we are, the A-team. Uh, my thanks to, to all of you. And uh, this hearing now stands adjourned. Thank you.